Hi everybody, this is Bill Bronchuk and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. This is a reschedule from last week. I apologize for technical difficulties we had last week. We had to reschedule. So today we're going to be talking about LLC formalities, keeping your LLC healthy, healthy. So many of you may know that LLCs, corporations, and other entities have certain formalities that are required by law in order to keep them healthy. What does I mean by healthy? Meaning if you get audited, you get sued, or something bad happens, you actually get the corporate protection that you thought you had. If your LLC or corporation is not healthy or very unhealthy, there's a good chance with an audit or in a lawsuit the entity will be disregarded and you can personally be held liable even though you formed an LLC. And you're probably thinking, wow, that's unfair. I formed an LLC to protect myself. How come I don't get the protection? Because you have to follow certain rules when it comes to your LLC. And when it comes to this stuff, there's what you know, what you don't know, and more importantly, and more dangerous, what you don't know that you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? So that's usually when you're in front of a judge or an IRS auditor and telling you what you don't know that you don't know. Don't be in that position. Learn ahead of time what it is that you don't know that you don't know and fix it. The first question I always get with LLCs is where do I file? Do I file in my home state? Do I file in some other state? So in most cases, in most cases, you should form your LLC in your local state, which you primarily do business where your operations are. Particularly if those of you watching are a real estate investor uh, or a small business person, you're only doing business in your state. In most cases, you're gonna form in your own state. In some cases, you may wanna form in a place like Delaware. Uh, an example might be if you were going to raise capital and you were gonna be the managing member and raising capital from passive people under a, a private offering. Delaware has some of the best protection for corporate managers, directors, and officers from liability for their misdeeds. Not if you steal, but for negligence or breach of fiduciary obligation. That's why a lot of corporations that operate in New York are formed in Delaware for that reason. Nobody in their right mind would serve on the board of directors of a corporation formed in New York because there's too much liability under New York law. Under Delaware law, on the other hand, you have to almost be caught with your hand in the piggy bank in order to be liable for breach of fiduciary obligation. So there are some cases if you want to do a series LLC, for example, um, series LLCs are not available in every state and Delaware it is available and you can form in Delaware and register in your home state and still have a series LLC. Delaware has one of the best statutes for that purpose. Nevada, a lot of people go to Nevada because there's all kinds of hype about the protection and privacy and all those things about Nevada. Um, Nevada has very favorable laws like Delaware, but Nevada is very expensive. And when people see Nevada, if you're not in Nevada, it just raises eyebrows a lot of times because there's a lot of scam artists that do file in Nevada. So unless you're operating in Nevada, I would probably stay out of Nevada. And then there's the new favorite, my favorite for a lot of cases is Wyoming. There are cases where you want to file in Wyoming, even though you don't live in Wyoming. It has many of the same benefits of Nevada and Delaware. It's extremely cheap. It doesn't have the stigma attached to it that uh, Nevada does and it can be a very favorable state for their laws which i'll explain why in just a little bit so in most cases the answer is if you're going to buy and flip houses or buy and hold rentals in new jersey then you form a new jersey llc in most cases we'll get to the exceptions in a bit generally speaking you want to avoid single member llc's what do i mean by that Single member LLCs is an LLC that has one owner, one member, where you personally, individually, as a, as a human being, are the sole member of that LLC. You generally want to avoid that for a number of reasons. Number one is for taxation. 
Now, if you're doing rental properties, for example, it's not that big of a deal because rental properties are not subject to FICA tax. But if you're do actively engaging in, in what we call ordinary or earned income, like wholesaling or flipping houses or operating a store or brokerage fees or things like that, those are earned income items which would be reported on your Schedule C. A single member LLC is disregarded. What it means is the member, whoever that may be, an individual or maybe another entity, so let's say in this case an individual, would report on their personal tax return. So if it's rental schedule E, that's okay because rental properties are not subject to self-employment tax for the most part. However, flips and wholesales very well could be, and you have to report on schedule C where you pay self-employment tax on your earnings, and that's a substantial amount, 15.3%. So you generally want to avoid single member LLCs where the individual, sole individual, is the member. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. There's four exceptions. Let me go over those. One, if the sole member is another entity. So if you layer, so if you have um, an apartment building under one LLC and three houses under another LLC and four condos under another LLC, and all those three LLCs are wholly owned by what we call a parent company, a parent company. Think of GM. General Motors is the parent, and then the subsidiaries or children are Buick, Chevrolet, Cadillac, etc. So if the sole member is, let's say, another entity that is multi-member LLC, it's a good idea to do that. Another reason why single-member LLCs are bad is for asset protection. Now, let me define what I mean by that. Lawsuit protection is, is claims from the outside in. Someone is suing the owner of the property for being injured, and the owner of the property is an LLC. You have protection that way. That's lawsuit protection or liability protection. Asset protection means someone gets a judgment against you totally unrelated to your real estate. You're driving your car, your kid's driving the car, and you get a multi-million dollar judgment in excess of your insurance, and they want to take the assets inside of that LLC. With a single member LLC, they can get to those assets. With a multiple member LLC, generally they cannot. That's why single member entities for holding assets is generally a bad idea with a few exceptions that I'll go over in just a moment. If the sole member is your IRA, that's fine because IRAs have their own built-in federal protection under ERISA law, so that's okay. If you choose an S corporation election, which is generally recommended if you're going to do earned income. So in that case, as the sole member, you're not gonna report on your personal Schedule C, you're gonna report on an S-Corp return if you make an S-Corp election. You'll file an 1120S return, just like any S-Corporation, and that's perfectly okay. And the fourth thing is if you formed in a, what we call a protective state. Some states, and let me back up a little bit, Limited partnerships for many, many years have what's called charging order protection. What does that mean? That means someone who has a judgment against them, a limited partner, can't get to the assets in the partnership and can't get any voting rights of the member and can't, uh, of the partner and can't get anything other than whatever income they were getting and they would get that under a charging order. But in that case, if the partners, specifically the general partner, shuts off the cash flow, the creditor gets nothing. That's perfectly legal. That's what's called charging order protection. LLCs have, in most states, similar protection. Not every state. Some states get, uh, have very good protection. Some states have mediocre protection. So, for example, in Colorado, about 12 years ago, there was a federal bankruptcy case, and the issue was, does a single owner, single member LLC afford the owner just simply charging order protection? They can't bust the thing up and get to the assets. And the court said, no, not in a single member, but in a multi-member, yes. So two other courts, I think one in Maryland and definitely one in Florida, ruled the same way. And then several states, including Nevada, Delaware, and Wyoming, amended their statutes specifically to say that a single member LLC 
does have charging order protection, meaning the only remedy for a creditor is a charging order. They can't get a receiver appointed, they can't foreclose their interest, they can't bust it up, very limited remedy, okay? So if you are going to form a single member LLC where you're the sole member, let's say for rental properties, then I would probably recommend you do it in one of those states that I mentioned that does have it. Now, there's a handful of other states that have it as well, other than these three, um, but Wyoming is, from what I've seen, substantially heads and shoulders above all the other ones. And it's not a very expensive one either. So you'd form it in, in, in Wyoming, and if you live in, let's say, Florida, you would register it as a foreign entity in the state of Florida. Another entity. So if another entity, let's look at that. If you had a single member LLC with another LLC as the sole member of that single member LLC, that's fine. An IRA account, an LLC single member, the single member is your IRA account and your IRA account has creditor protection built in. An S corp election where you have the sole member is an individual, but you're filing taxes as an S corporation and only doing earned income, meaning you're not accumulating assets in there, because again, same issue with single member, but you're not paying self-employment tax. And protective states formed in Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, et cetera, where it's a single individual owner. I personally like layering it with multiple entities, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Do you already have an LLC? I'm sure most of you who are watching or listening to this have an LLC already. And what's scary is, is your company safe? Well, according to a recent survey of, of a thousand lawyers by the American Bar Association, and they were asked the question, do you think your clients would survive a lawsuit or an IRS audit with their LLC? And they said 95% of them reported that these small businesses are operating under a false sense of security because they don't follow the rules. So how do we follow the rules? Well, an LLC gives you liability protection. You are the member, just like a shareholder of a corporation, you're protected from outside in liabilities, meaning debts, lawsuits, slip and falls, whatever it may be, the company will protect you from liability. There is, I'm a, Three exceptions to that rule, but let me start out before I get to the three exceptions is, if you're the manager of the LLC, and let's say you're renting a rental property, and it is alleged that you discriminated against a potential tenant, your LLC would be liable, but so would you personally, because you did the wrongdoing personally. What I'm talking about is liability protection if you had an employee, or a property manager or a broker that did it, they'd be liable, your, your LLC would be liable, but not you personally. That's what I mean. But there are three exceptions where you can get held liable. Number one, I've said it before, failure to keep proper records. We're gonna go through what those are. Number two, oh, let's go through my PowerPoint's a little off. Proper records. So you should have an operating agreement. Many of you may have formed an LLC and you did it online with your secretary of state, paid the fee, got your tax ID number from the IRS website, and that's all you did. You really need to have an operating agreement for the company. The operating agreement is a very important document. And some key provisions that should be in your operating agreement is, first of all, you gotta identify managers and members. In most states, when you file your articles or certificate of formation with the state, you don't list who the members are. In most states, you don't even list who the managers are. So how does anybody know who has authority? Like you go to a closing, your title company's gonna say, let me see a copy of your operating agreement. You go to a bank, say, I want a bank, a bank account open. They're gonna say, who's the manager? Prove it. Because all I can see online is a document with the name and address of the company, nothing more. So you gotta identify who they are and what their percentage of interest is. What are their powers and duties as managers? What are the voting requirements? Let's say you have like two or three or four members. Is it unanimous vote? Is it majority vote? Is it super majority vote? And depending on what the issue is, it may be different. How many people does it take to have a meeting and a quorum? So how many people have to be present? If you have five members, will three members showing up 
make a quorum for the meeting or do all members show up? Okay, that's called a quorum. What about assigning or selling your membership interest? What are the rules with that? Can you sell your interest without your co-members um, permission? What about bringing in new members? Let's say that the managing member uh, is, is a big developer and has 15 or 20 investors. Can he bring in more investors and dilute the existing members without a vote? It's very important. And creditor protection provisions. Can a, can a creditor become a substitute member and have voting rights that really identify that very, very, very clearly? I like to do in my operating agreement classes of membership, A class, B class. So the initial members are, B, are A class and they have all the voting rights and all the rights to inspect books and records and all that stuff. And B class members don't have jack. All they get is a K-1 for their, for their uh, income and an annual expense report and that's about it. So it says in my agreement that anybody who becomes an involuntary member, meaning by a judgment, is a class B member. Very, very big protection. And what about a buy-sell agreement? What if someone dies, gets divorced, files bankruptcy, is disabled, wants to retire? What about provisions for buying that person out? Can, can the other members get a first right of refusal? What is the formula for buying them out? These should all be spelled out in an operating agreement. So proper records. Operating agreement is the first thing. You wanna have minutes of your initial meeting. So after you form the company, you have uh, minutes of an initial meeting of the members and managers where you outline certain things, such as maybe a resolution for opening a bank account, um, the nature of the company's business, if it's gonna register to do business in other states and so forth, that should be documented in minutes. What about annual meetings? Now in most states, you're not required to have an annual meeting of an LLC like corporations are required to have. But if your operating agreement says you have to have an annual meeting, then you have to take minutes of an annual meeting and put them in your company record book each year. What about a special meeting? In, in addition to the annual meeting, which is usually just to elect the managers and some other relevant business, what if you need to have a special meeting? How do you call a special meeting? How many people does it take to make a quorum? How do you document that and so forth? And then one of my favorite things I have in my operating agreement is the ability to do what's called a consent in lieu of a meeting. Now, if you're a single member or husband and wife LLC, it seems kind of ridiculous to call a meeting for yourself, right? You call a meeting for yourself, you mail notice, you show up, you have a meeting, you write minutes, you pass resolutions and you write those up. That seems like a lot of jumping through hoops. So, what I have in my operating agreement is the ability that if we need a resolution, which is usually passed at a meeting for something, the members, if they all agree, can sign a unanimous consent in lieu of a meeting. So it's a one page form that says, in lieu of a meeting, the members and managers agree to the following, resolve that a bank account may be open, signed member, signed manager, done. You don't have to have a meeting. You don't have to keep minutes. You don't have to do all that stuff. So that's a very, very, very good form to have. When do you need a special resolution, by the way? Anytime your LLC engages in a transaction that is out of the, quote, ordinary course of its business. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you're in the business, if your articles of organization and or your operating agreement says, you're in the business of buying and renting houses, do you need a resolution, a special resolution, every time you buy or sell a house or every time you lease a property? No, because that is in the ordinary course of business. What if you wanted your company to lease you a car? Well, that is not in the ordinary course of business and that would require a special resolution. You get my draft if it was gonna lease an office for operations, that's not the ordinary course of business. So any, when in doubt, do a special resolution by a unanimous consent in lieu of a meeting and put it in your company record. Having clean books, that's a very important thing. Keep track of all income and expenses. Keep track of assets and liabilities. And by the way, QuickBooks is the preferred software that everybody uses for this. You don't have to, you can use a spreadsheet, but unless you're really good at Excel, I'd recommend QuickBooks or something like that. Don't commingle funds. This is where everyone gets in trouble. 
Commingling means this. You're at the supermarket. You don't have any money with you, so you use the company checkbook to write groceries. You shouldn't do that, okay? You shouldn't do that. Or you take cash out of the ATM machine out of the company account to spend it on personal things, or vice versa. You know, you're, you're with a contractor and they need to get paid and you don't have a company check, so you write a personal check. Don't do those things. And if you do do those things, submit an expense reimbursement to the company and document that with a check back. Okay, so don't be cavalier with the mixing, mixing and matching of personal and company funds. And don't use, you know, assets or money from one to the other. Document monies in and out of the LLC to yourself. So this is very important. A lot of people screw this up. So they have an LLC account, and especially if they have a single member, because remember, single member doesn't report on a tax return, it's disregarded. So if you wrote a check out of the LLC account to yourself personally, there's no tax implication of that because it's just you. It's just like a DBA for tax purposes. But you still should note it in the books as a capital distribution or a cap if it's a partnership, a capital draw, okay? A partnership draw. If you put money in, what was that for? Was that a capital contribution? Or was it a loan? If it was a loan, do you have a promissory note and a special resolution approving that loan, whether it's coming in or going out to you or from the company? Make sure you document these things. By the way, if your company's five years old and you haven't done any of these things, should you go back and backdate it? No, as an attorney, I can't tell you to do that. But I will tell you if you got audited or sued, it would be better that you had them than if you didn't, and that's all I'm gonna say. All right, so the exceptions to the rule are failure to keep proper records. Number two is any illegal or fraudulent activity. Most judges are gonna bend over backwards to hold you personally liable anyway, so the LLC form probably won't protect you. And the company assets are not safe, meaning if you hold all your business assets in an LLC, and there was a liability from your business. Well, your home would be protected, your car, your personal bank account, but all your business assets that belong to the LLC could be lost. So you, what you want to do is segregate assets up into groups, into baskets, so you can't lose everything at once. A common mistake is people form an LLC and put all their properties and assets in one LLC. Well, a lawsuit against the LLC means it's fair game to collect on a judgment on all the LLC's assets. Another way people do it is one LLC for every property, separate LLC for each property. And this is overkill, not to mention expensive, not to mention the fact that you have a bank account for every LLC. And if you've got 35 LLCs and 35 properties, you're gonna be so busy having meetings with yourself you won't have time to do business. <laughs> so uh, unless we're talking about maybe property one's an apartment building, property two is a commercial storefront, property three is an office building. Yes, each one would have its own LLC. But for single family homes, uh, condos, duplexes, you know, it really depends on where you live, what the fees are with your state, how many bank accounts can you handle, what the cost is. So, you know, in a state like California, where they charge $800 per year in franchise tax, you know, you're probably going to be every three to five properties. In Texas, where the properties are cheap, uh, you might be the same, maybe every seven properties. I don't know, depending on how many properties you have and what you want to take care of. So what I would suggest is maybe three properties in one LLC, two properties in another LLC, another three properties in another LLC, these LLCs would be local LLCs formed in the state where the properties are located. And then the LLCs are all single member, but owned by a master entity, a parent entity formed in Wyoming, Nevada, Delaware, or other favorable state, which is very strict and limited charging order protection. That's what I like to do. Okay, so, and if you want to take it one step further, it's off the topic, but you could title each house in a land trust first and then go into an LLC below it, but that's sort of corollary to the topic today, but 
Uh, it's not either an LLC or a land trust. It would just be another layer if you wanted to use LLC, uh, land trusts instead of titling them directly in the LLC. Okay, so take a good look at that. You got a master entity in a very favorable state. You have sub entities formed in the states where the properties are located. You need a bank account for each LLC. Each LLC has its bank account. Um, but in terms of bookkeeping, which is nice is, let's say this master LLC was a partnership, two people. It would file a tax return. What about the LLCs below it? Well, they're single member, they don't file a tax return. So all the properties, income and expenses are reported on the master LLC's return, which means you only need one set of books and QuickBooks, which is really nice. But you do need separate bank accounts for the flow of the money. If you have any questions as we go, by the way, hit me up there in the Q&A, uh, and I will be happy to answer them as we go. Creating an operating agreement. So if you haven't done an operating agreement yet, if you're forming a new company, you need an operating agreement. If you used some crappy online service whose names I won't mention, <coughs> it'll zoom. Uh, <laughs> They're pretty weak agreements. They're generic, they're boilerplate, they're plain vanilla, they're C minus at best. Uh, most of the things I talked about earlier that should be in an operating agreement are not there. So if you want a good operating agreement, if you don't have an operating agreement, you want to update your operating agreement, I have now a new service. You know, you can pay a lawyer to do it. You can use it, first you can use a generic service like LegalZoom when you, when you file, if you file with them. You can piece together provisions you find on the internet. You can search and replace and hunt and pack and do what you need to do. You could pay an attorney to do it. Generally, I charge about $750 to draw up an operating agreement. Or my new legalwiz.com automated operating agreement creator. Now, I've created here through technology on my website a service where you answer questions, it's about a dozen or so questions, some of them are drop down, some of them are handwritten in, and it spits out a document for, I've got one for single member disregarded, single member uh, husband and wife disregarded, and multiple member partnership. I don't have one yet for uh, automated for S Corp LLC, but I do have a separate kit for that on LegalWiz.com that you can get, but it's not automated. Those three forms are automated. And the great thing is, is it's only $97. And you can use it as many times as you want for as many LLCs as you want for, for life. Yours or mine, whichever comes first. <laughs> so um, that's the uh, link there. It's not in my store yet, but that's the direct link. So what I will do is, I'll see if I can post it in the chat here so everybody could see the link. And then you can copy and paste into your browser. Let's see. LLC. Yeah, I know it's kind of a long URL. There it goes. So look in your chat there. Oops, I sent it to the room, only to panelists. Let me send it to all of the users. There we go. Boom. So look in your chat there and you will see a link there. If I typed it right, let me see. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, copy and paste it into your browser and you could find that page and order it today. No, discount coupons are applicable to this particular product. It is super bought based, bargain basement cheap already, and you get to use it as many times as you want. So. And so what it does is you fill out the questions, it spits out a form, it takes like three minutes, and emails it to you in Word, so you could further edit it as you need it, um, as you see fit, okay? All right. Um, any questions? Thank you, someone clicked on the link and it works, thank you. Uh, any questions, pop them in there in the Q&A, and I'd be happy to answer them now.
Well, people are popping the questions in the chat. That's fun. Oh, um, so the first question is, can a single member become a multi-member? And the answer is yes. Um, what you would do is assign a portion of the single member's membership interest to the newly added member, right? Um, and then you do a new operating agreement. And basically, you, it's called an amended and restated operating agreement. So if you already have an operating agreement, you would just title the top of the operating agreement, amended and restated operating agreement, okay? Um, if you don't have an operating agreement at all, then just use the operating agreement as is, okay? But an assignment of membership. So an assignment of membership is a simple form. It just says, I, as 100% member of XYZ company, assign 50% of my membership to Joe Blow, and you sign and date. And it's pretty much as simple as that. Um, let's see. The type of operating agreements I have available on the automated one uh, are single member individual or company, meaning a company is the single member, a uh, husband and wife disregarded, which a lot of husband and wives like doing it that way, and then partnership. So husband and wife can either be disregarded or partnership, depending on how you want to file. A lot of people prefer filing Schedule E, so they'd be disregarded. If you're two or more people, whether husband and wife or not, you can be a partnership. If you need an S-Corp operating agreement, get my S-Corp LLC kit, which is on LegalWiz.com. Just click on Store. I have a separate one. It's not automated yet, the form, but I'm working on it. Uh, when you go from single to multi-member, does that change tax filing? Yes, it does. It becomes a partnership. It becomes a partnership. So you got to file a partnership return. Larry asks, I have a Colorado single member LLC for Texas fourplex. Good or bad? Um, well, first of all, did you register it in Texas? Because Texas charges $800 to register a foreign entity there. So I hope you did that. If you didn't, um, you know, Texas has series LLCs. So that's, I would probably, and it's a pretty good statute. So I'd probably form, if you plan on buying more properties in Texas, a Texas series LLC. Otherwise, um, if you have other properties under other LLCs, then do what I suggested earlier, which is layer them with master parent subsidiary relationship. Do I also, also assist clients in setting up master LLCs in Nevada, Delaware, and Wyoming? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. You can get in touch with me directly. I'll put my email in there directly if you want to get in touch with me. Okay. Da, 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 da. All righty then. Let's see. Any more questions? Can I get a Wyoming LLC remotely? Yes. Most states you can file remotely. California is unfortunately one of the few that still require manual walk-in of documents. We use a service for that. Um, but there are services you can use that are cheap, that are better than LegalZoom at all. The problem is I have with LegalZoom is not so much that their that their um, documents are weak; um, they're slow. Number one, and number two, the really annoying thing is is they they upsell the heck out of you in a very subtle way. You like you, you you like choose package A, and it says you get this, this, and this. But what it doesn't say, or it says in the fine print, is that after three months you're going to be billed for that extra little bonus service. So be very, very careful when you use those services, what you're getting billed for. Particularly uh, registered agent. Um, Registeredagents.com, which I'm going to put in the chat here, is one of the best, cheapest nationwide registered agent service if you're forming in, a, in an LLC in a jurisdiction you don't have an office in. You need a registered agent there. They're about 70 bucks a year. 
Uh, last I checked, LegalZoom was charging 185 or something absurd like that. Uh, really expensive. And so that's why they do the service cheap because they get the recurring fees. Larry asked, use Quick Oils? I think he meant Quick Books for the master LLC and all the others. Uh, yes, Larry. You can, the way I set it up in QuickBooks um, is I have the master LLC as the company and each subsidiary single member owned is just set up as, a, as, a, as an account, like a, like a bank account. So you don't need separate sets of books for all the subsidiaries. Uh, George S. Illinois does not have strong or strong charging order protections. We recommend recommend having an LLC in another state. Yeah, I would probably form it in another state if they have crappy charging order protection, and then register it in Illinois as a foreign. Uh, Vincent, if you just flip, which is better, S corp or LLC? I'm also Canadian. Well, you, as a Canadian, you can have an S corp because to be have an S corp you have to be either a citizen or a resident alien um so you'd have to go with what Canadians generally do is they go with um a limited partnership because LLCs in Canada are taxed as C corps there's, there's no pass through so Canadians generally do family limited partnerships if you want to contact me I can give you the uh, rundown on that okay any more questions? These are really good questions, by the way. Excellent questions. Oh, I have more questions here on the Q&A. Bob asks, generally, how much does it cost to register out-of-state LLCs? Well, you have to register it in the, out of, in the state. You know, so let's say you do Wyoming. It's about 100 and... 25 bucks, I think, um, off the top of my head. And then if you do business in Ohio, you have to register and pay the Ohio fee, which is usually the same as a domestic uh, Ohio entity. Bob asked, is equity stripping a viable asset protection strategy? Um, equity stripping is where you put, you make like a, lender LLC that puts mortgages against your properties. Um, and in most cases, that won't work. When I say it won't work, meaning if you get into court, it's going to fold like a wet taco. But for the purposes of dissuading litigation, if someone looks up your property and sees a first mortgage for 60% and a second mortgage, you know, the phony one, the equity stripping one for 40%, um, then there's no equity, it's going to dissuade people from wanting to sue you because they think you have no equity. So to that extent, yes. But does it really work in court? It's very hard. It's very hard. Most people have lost in court on that one. Bob asks, I thought I read that in Florida, a husband-wife LLC was judged a single-member LLC. For what purpose? for taxes or for charging order protection. Um, I know for taxes, you can go either way. Um, for charging order protection, I'm not aware of any case that says that, but if there has been a case, then I would definitely not be forming your LLC in Florida uh, unless you have a master entity that is formed in a place like Wyoming. Uh, Shelly asks, Rowan Shelley asks, do you have an example of an annual meeting documentation or does a general word document work as long as it has the required info? Um, yeah, um, the, um, I don't know if the, uh, the thing I set up has a resolution in lieu, you don't really need an annual meeting. Again, you can do a consent in lieu of an annual meeting form meaning everybody signs and says, in lieu of an annual meeting, we agree to the following, like I said earlier. I'll look that one up, Bob. Email me, please, if you have the uh, link. Uh, I will look into that. If that's the case, that's really bad news for Florida. 
Um, but it's good business for Wyoming. All right. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Thank you for participating today. It's been my privilege and pleasure. And uh, go to the link there and sign up for the program. And if you have any questions, just drop me an email. Thank you, everyone, for attending.